Okay. Hello, everybody. My name's Alexander Dibbo. I'm here today to talk about a four version fast forward upgrade that we did earlier this year at STFC. So, today, I'm going to initially I'll introduce STFC and SCD because it's the first time we've presented at, up, at the OpenStack Summit. I'll then give you a bit of a rundown on what the STFC cloud is. Lane go through the various stages we went through in planning and implementing our upgrade and what we learned from the process. So initially, what is STFC? So STFC is one of the UK's research councils. It's the Science and Technology Facilities Council. It provides large-scale facilities for science and it's also one of the funding bodies for research in the UK. So we support we have around 1,700 scientists directly employed by STFC, and we provide access to around 7,500 scientists within the UK and internationally as well. We run science and innovation campuses across the UK in various facilities. The one I'm based at is the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, which is just outside Oxford. There's also the Dawesbury Lab, which is in the north of England, and some other interesting facilities like an observatory, and there's a research facility in a mine in the north of England as well, which is an interesting site. So, STFC science programs. So, we support a lot of particle physics, so we work, we contribute to CERN and work on the Large, ha on the large Hadron Collider there. We're in various astronomy, astronomy experiments as well, so we're involved with the European Space Agency, the Square Kilometre Array, and we have involvement with nuclear physics as well. As I said, one of the things that we do is provide large-scale facilities, so we have neutron sources, high-power lasers, light sources, which are at our various campuses. So, then into the scientific computing department, which is probably of more interest to people here. So. This is the scientific computing department for STFC. It's more than just IT, so we don't provide any of the corporate services or anything like that, like STFC users. We're focused purely on what scientists need to deliver their research. So we've got 180 staff supporting all of STFC's users. We have various expertise in application development, hosting services, providing large e-infrastructures. Yeah, so onto the infrastructure. So for the STFC facility specifically, we post large amounts of data, so rising from about a petabyte in 2013 to what's that, 14 petabytes approximately this year. And we provide analysis infrastructure for that as well, so a HPC facility and the cloud service, which I run, which I'll go into more detail later. We have various scientists and developers, they're about half scientist, half developer, so they know how to, how to achieve research, how to get the most out of the software, to get the most out of the infrastructures we provide. We, there's various simulations that we do as part of this in the computational biology and life sciences area, various things in engineering environment areas, so the diagrams you can see here are in the top left, a nuclear reactor and how, how the heat load is distributed in there. The second is how air moves around a, in a turbine. The third is how blood moves through a blood pump. And the fourth one is how water moves in a washing machine. So, a lot of diverse use there. Then there's computational chemistry. So the usual kinds of things you'd expect from this, material science, how it applies to biology and physics as well. Then we've got the Large Hadron Collider, the, IT, the computing we provide for that. We're one of the tier one sites, so we provide 24,000 CPU cores, 64 petabytes of storage, about, about a third of that being disk, the rest being on tape. There's a 100 gigabit network, and we've got a 30 gigabit direct optical link to CERN as well. Then we've got one of the other large infrastructure facilities we run called Jasmine. 
which has 38 petabytes of high performance storage. It's what we call a super data cluster rather than a supercomputer or a HTC form. So it's really focused on putting high performance data next to high performance computing. Then a new project which is started earlier this year it's called Daphne. It's the it's a system for aggregating the various models that we've got in the UK for physical infrastructure. So roadways, railways, all those kinds of things, and how they will interact if you make a change in one. So things like planning new railways and that kind of stuff. So then, on to what you probably all care more about, the STFC cloud. So this initially started off back before I joined STFC as an experiment done by a few graduates using a product called Stratus Labs that proved somewhat successful and certainly showed enough potential for us to pursue things. In 2014, we deployed the SCD cloud for the scientific computing department, which was based on Open Nebula and primarily intended to support internal users. Because of the success of that, we got a lot more users, a lot more use cases coming on board that we really couldn't meet without significant re-architecture. At the same time as doing that re-architecture, we moved to OpenStack because of much better support in the community and a much greater feature set. So who uses the STFC cloud? So there's internal users within SCD. So everything from development and testing infrastructures through to people hosting actual services for European projects, for work within the UK, all kinds of things. There's the work support in the STFC facilities, so the ISIS neutron source, the central laser facility, and the diamond light source. There's the LHC computing grid, which I mentioned the tier one site for. They also use the cloud for some of their capacity. And the Ada Lovelace Centre, which again is a relatively new project, it aims at simplifying end-to-end -end the software and the infrastructure required for the STFC facilities and other things. There's the IRIS collaboration, which is a UK-wide collaboration to deliver e-infrastructure for STFC. And then the Daphne service, which I mentioned, which are probably going to be using the cloud in one capacity or another. So onto the cloud architecture. So now we're running on Queen's OpenStack. Prior to the upgrade process I'm going to talk about, we were running Mitaka. We use Ceph for RBD storage. We deploy using a configuration tool called Quator, which originally came out of the high energy physics community. And it's one that is, has been used in STFC for a few years. And it's the tool that we chose to use when we deployed it. We use Scientific Linux, again, because of close ties to the high energy physics community. For the OpenStack packages, we currently use the RDO packages provided through the CentOS repositories. So in terms of the pure architecture, we run all of the OpenStack services you would generally expect us to run, so Keystone, Nova, Neutron, Glans, Ryzen, Cinder, Heat. And we use Rally for doing functional testing to ensure we keep everything up and running. We run three instances of everything to provide high availability. We put those behind load balancers, which use HA proxy and keep alive D to keep everything highly available. We, again, we run MariaDB using Glary replication to keep everything HA, free RabbitMQ servers, free MongoDBs for Celometer. For the networking, we have a routed network to give us the best performance we can possibly manage to get. So leaf spine network, we run Cumulus Linux on our routers and we use VXLAN and EVPN to do overlays. For our tenant networks, we use KVM on the hypervisors and open vSwitch for the hypervisor networking. So that's 38 service nodes, 166 hypervisors, 66 storage nodes. That delivers around 4,000 usable CPU cores at present and just under a petabyte of usable storage. So as I mentioned, we use, we have 
We're exposing a number of different physical networks to our users. So there's the actual physical network, which, which we expose to our admin users for testing and debugging of things, but that's not exposed to regular users. We have various eVPN VLAN networks, which is a, a thing provided by Cumulus. So we have a services network for internal OpenStack services to run on, an internal network for VMs that only need to be, only need to to be reachable by everything within STFC. And we have an external network for our floating IPs for tenant networks. Then we have VXLAN tenant networks for our actual users. So now into the real meat of things, the fast forward upgrade. So starting off with what is a fast forward upgrade? So from the documentation, a fast forward upgrade is an offline upgrade which effectively runs the upgrade processes for all versions of open of OpenStack components from your originating version to your desired final version. So, in short, it's a fully automated multi-stage upgrade. So, in preparing for this, because we run Quartar, which for most intents and purposes can be considered an in-house tool because there's a relatively small amount of users of it, and we all are primary developers of the OpenStack part of that. So, we started off studying the documentation, update the update Quattos template libraries and configuration as per the documentation, back up our production in, pre-production instance, update the local configuration to use the updated Quattos configuration, script any necessary changes, test it using Rally to check if everything works, then fix any problems, put them back upstream if necessary, into our configuration, whatever we need to do. Roll back to the database before we started the upgrade, and then go through it again and see if it works automated this time. If that doesn't work, then we go through the process again until we get it working. And we did that with each of the upgrades we went through, so from Mitaka, through Newton, Nakata, Pike, and on to Queens, finally. So, in preparation for the upgrade, we wanted we wanted to minimise the downtime for our VMs for the workloads as much as possible. So, to prevent any interruption from those, we first did a rolling upgrade of our, all of our hypervisors to the latest versions of Flipper, QEMU, and Open vSwitch. So, the things which would cause network dropouts or VMs to need to lose connect connectivity, anything along those lines. So, we went with the versions from the Red Hat Enterprise Linux for QEMU and Libvert. Um, we went straight to the Queen's version, the, ver the Open vSwitch version provided in the Queen's repo for that. We blacklisted the packages from all of our other repositories so that we don't accidentally install them during the processes. So that allowed us to, when we came to doing the actual upgrades, to upgrade the hypervisors without interrupting any VMs. So in terms of testing the upgrade, we had our rally test that we'd done as part of preparing the upgrades to ensure that all the functionality we knew about and that users had told us they were using worked. We then released the fully upgraded pre-production instance to our users to test against and not, none of our users took us up on this, which they may have, they could have regretted later, but wasn't too bad. Fortunately. So, the actual upgrade process. We had a three day maintenance window to do this in. It was at a time when there was going to be some interruptions in other areas in, for various reasons. So, one of the things that was happening at the same time as this was some power testing, which we were assured wouldn't interrupt anything. So, after we'd gone through the upgrade process, preparing the upgrade process. We weren't completely confident that we'd be able to do it fully automated. So we went, so we opted instead to go version by version, performing a few extra tests ourselves in between, just so if we got a problem in the first upgrade, it wouldn't be compounded through the rest of the upgrades. So the actual process was similar to the, similar to the Preparation, so back up the databases, update the config on the load balancers, so any endpoint changes, anything like that would be done 
when the new versions were up and running. First, we upgraded Keystone. Then, we upgraded for the rest of the OpenStack components, excluding the hypervisors and Horizon. Once they'd all been upgraded, upgraded the hypervisors, then Horizon to expose everything to our users, test it, fix any problems that arose. So, our rollout, our backout plan for if there was any major problems, we'd restore about database backups, and if there was time left in our maintenance window, we'd try again. And once we got to the last version we could get to, that's when we'd call it a day in terms of once we hit our main, the end of our maintenance window. So I'm not going to go through the exact steps that's required for every individual OpenStack upgrade. They're pretty well documented and they were enough to get us most of the way there on most things. So instead I'm just going to cover the, any issues that came up as part of our upgrade process and what we did to get around those. So starting with the first upgrade, Mitaka to Newton. So a few issues came up with this upgrade. So an issue with Nova prevented it from being able to list instances. So there was a schema change in Nova API build request, I believe it was. A new field was added which couldn't be null and we had some instances that were stuck in this state from prior to the upgrade because of an issue we'd had. So when the data migration happened, at least didn't get updated. It was kind of annoying, but we we deleted loads from the database and, and then Nova was able to list instances again. We had an issue with database connections in Newton, in Neutron, which prevented the listing of networks. So after going through the logs and various bits of documentation, we discovered we needed to increase the queue pool limit for the databases. So we increased that to the same amount as the number of agents we have, which resolved that issue. And unrelated to the upgrade, we, had, we lost a rack of hypervisors during the upgrade because something went wrong in the power testing. Actually lost power to the switch, which then caused us to lose the hypervisors. Didn't have any upgrade impact on the upgrade. Once the power came back a few minutes later, we carried on with the upgrade and everything went fine. That took about half a day for that upgrade. So we, at that point, we called it a day for the first day. We'd gone into the afternoon far enough that we didn't think we'd be able to complete the next upgrade before the end of the day, and we didn't want to leave our users hanging overnight if we could avoid it. So then on to Newton to Arcata. So this was the most time-consuming upgrade for us. So technically there wasn't a huge amount of, there wasn't any major problems with it, but when we came to adding the cells and doing the online data migration, it took a lot longer than we were expecting it to. After doing a bit of digging, we discovered that was because we hadn't archived all of our old instances before the upgrade. So we did that, and then what had taken several hours and hadn't completed then happened in about 20 minutes, which was pretty good. Because of the delays and a bit of digging we had to do to find that, that took all of the second day of the upgrades. So then when we went our cat to Pike, this was a lot quicker than we expected it to be. We didn't hit any major issues. It took about two hours from start to end to rally test passing and users being able to create VMs again, which was great. It's a real improvement in terms of technical and documentation on how things happen. So then the final upgrade, we did Pike to Queens. So, Again, we didn't actually have any problems with the upgrade as such. We did the upgrade. At the end of the upgrade, all of our testings, testing was working. That took about two hours. Then we had a couple of problems. So one of the things, one of the problems we had was our hypervisors would now auto disable after a number of failures. So that was problematic. That was made worse because one of the ways in which we exposed our networks to users, some of the projects had two ways of accessing the external network, both as an external network and as a shared network to place VMs directly on the external network. 
That no longer seemed to work after the packed Queen's update, and it wasn't a thing that we tested for because we weren't completely aware that that was how users were using it. So we took that. What we ended up doing was removing shared access to the external network. The reason users had had access to that was when there'd been a issue with some of the internal, some of the site firewalling for our internal network, which meant that users needed another way of creating it, and the external network had been given access as a quick fix to get them up and running again. So once we'd done that, then everything was working. We re-enabled the hypervisors who'd been auto, that had been auto-disabled because of the issue with the external network. And then after well, the following day, we discovered that we were unable to snapshot on the hypervisors, so we couldn't snapshot our VMs, which wasn't a thing that we tested for. Uh, it's a thing that we've since added to our suite of functional tests. So after various bits of digging, we discovered that this, was, this is due to the way the URLs were internally handled by Glance, I believe. So we added show multiple locations as per the most up-to-date Ceph documentation for OpenStack, and that resolved our problem. So what did we learn as part of this upgrade? So the big thing we learned was our pre-production instance is somewhat of an idealized version of our production instance. There's various quick fixes and things that we haven't been able to reproduce on our development cluster, so the fix had gone straight into production. That's something that we're working hard to minimize happening again. And we need to make sure that we get our users more involved in the testing, because if they had been involved, then the external network issue would have been picked up sooner, and it would have been less less problems for them. We're not entirely sure how to get our users more involved in the testing at the moment, but it's something we're working on with them. So, in conclusion, I'm glad we didn't commit to just doing a fully automated fast-forward upgrade, largely because I feel some of the issues we caught, if we hadn't caught them when we did, could have caused much bigger problems further through the upgrade process. So the stage approach, it was more time consuming, but it gave us the flexibility to back out at a particular version if we needed to. Okay. So that's it for me. Any questions? Yes? Did you run into any issues of while doing the database migrations? So the only issue we ran into, as I said, was due to it taking a huge amount of time. We'd got or five million records that hadn't been archived in our various instances tables. Once we'd got those archived out, then the upgrade was much faster. But we didn't have any actual issues in terms of anything else. And when you're doing the migration, did you do it on a different database or, or the cluster taken down? So what we did was we stopped the backups in the cluster, did it on the primary. And then once everything was done, we brought the others back up. We found when we were doing our preparation that just running it on the primary seemed to push the backups over. They then started to have problems. We never quite got to the bottom of why, but it was easy enough for us to just upgrade the primary and then replicate the changes afterwards. And were you using Nova cells when you were in the No, we weren't. So we only brought Nova cells in for the Okata version. And did that have any implication for migration? No, apart from it taking time to discover all of the instances, it all went pretty smoothly. Are there yeah. any for backup the database and recovery? So for backup, we use Pocono Extra Backup to do the backup. We use Pocona's extra backup product to do the backup of the databases. It makes restoring is a bit trickier because you have to restore it cold, but you can back it up while it's running and still get a consistent backup, which is a thing we'd like. So that's what we use for our nightly backup process as well. 
Any other questions? No? Okay. Thank you, everyone.